Okay, uh, we're going to talk about mites now, and the principal and most common one is spider mites, which probably everybody who's ever grown has had spider mites at one time or another. Uh, and you can tell it you have them first if you're observant, if you're going out there and looking at plants uh, consistently, you'll see a little stippling. You'll see like little little points on your leaves where it's it's white, the chlorophyll is gone. And that's because they're sucking the juices out of the plant. And they're going to be on the underside of the leaves. And the, the way I used to tell if I, for sure, if I had them, I'd take that leaf off, I'd look up at the lights through the leaves and I could see those little black spots. I'd try to give them a little poke and see if they move. And that's the way you can tell them. Other than that, you need a, a pretty strong loop to really look at them. The other mites are, are, are even smaller, the broad and the russet mites. You really actually need a microscope to see them. Uh, and all, all the mite problems can be really difficult. Uh, especially if they're, if once they really start to establish themselves, you're in trouble. Now, the, the spider mites, how they actually get on your plants is, is beyond me because I've found them in, in every kind of grow. I found them in apartment buildings, in, in attics, in, in, in basements. It just seems that they're, they're around. If you have the right conditions for spider mites, you'll get them, and the right conditions are hot and dry and also still air. In fact, one of the ways you prevent ever getting spider mites is to constantly have a fan going and, and blowing on your plants, moving the leaves, and keeping, it, keeping that air moving. Uh, they like still conditions. They like the still conditions. They like it really hot and dry. Now, the russets, uh, 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 the russets and the broad mites are another story altogether. Those get carried in by mites. They piggyback on, on your regular spider mites. That's how small they are. But the, the main way I think that they infect people's grows is because people get clones. And the clones, they bring, in, they bring in the rusted mites. They're infected. The person who's selling it probably doesn't know that. They've sprayed them with whatever miticides they have, and they put them out there. And you don't know it until a couple of months later, all of a sudden, you've got a really difficult problem to deal with. So when I recommend to people who are taking in clones, I say you need an isolation room, a real isolation room where you're not going in and out of that room handling this plant and going back to your crop. That has to be isolated until at least a few months old to know for sure that it's clean, it doesn't have a russet mite or broad mite problem. Anytime you're introducing some sort of, yeah, new right. plant or new genetics into right. the garden scenario, you need to have some sort of quarantine area. Absolutely. And that, that's good for every, every kind of pest, but really for the russets and the broad, it's especially important because you just don't see them. You know, they're microscopic. Excellent. Uh, Kyra, do you have anything to add as far as uh, identification of uh, spider mites or broad mites? Um, as far as identification goes, it's really challenging with the broad, like Mel said, because they're very tiny, so you are going to okay. need a, a microscope more okay. than just a, a 10 power hand lens. Mm -hmm. um, you, will noticing this, you will notice the stippling to begin with right. for yep. most spider mite species. Beyond that, what it turns into, especially for the russets, why they're called russets, is they do a russeting, kind of a coppery look when you see the damage. Often the, with the russet damage, it starts at the base and works its way up. I think what Mel talked about, he really hit the nail on the head. You can prevent so many problems mm. by sanitation and quarantine, quarantine yeah. and prevention. Just keeping on top of these things and being diligent about monitoring for them, you can stop a lot of them in their tracks. And if we're in the unfortunate situation where we do uh, recognize an infestation, right. uh, what kind of controls can we do? What kind of management can we do? We do have some options available to us. Now, first and foremost, along with the monitoring and cultural practices, we want everybody to plant bean plants. Green beans, bush beans, pole beans, it doesn't really matter. Beans and eggplants, specifically amongst marijuana crops, will pull a lot of these sucking pests out of the grow, and they will show you the symptoms and the evidence of the pest long before you're gonna see it on your, your market crop. So having an early detection system like a bean plant or an eggplant is imperative to a grow operation. Uh, forceful sprays of water, like Mel said, they like hot and dry conditions. So anytime you can just increase the humidity around your plants, more frequent misting is going to really suppress the spider mites, spider mites, mm -hmm. and encourage your predators and your predatory mites. From there, we can step up the assault to soapy water sprays. Castile soap is a little bit softer on your leaves. You can also use Dawn, a detergent, just dish soap, but it is detergent, not soap, so it does have a chance to burn the leaves more so than a Castile soap. 
Um, another thing, we can use oils. So in the vegetative state, we can use things like neem oil, plant oils like that, or horticultural oils. They work by coating the insects and suffocating them, covering their breathing holes. So that can be effective. One very important consideration, especially with oils, is the conditions that favor spider mites are not the kind of conditions you want to typically use oils in, so be very aware of that. Same thing with the diatomaceous earth. Spider mites are another crawling insect, so they will crawl over something like diatomaceous earth, get cut up because this is jagged when you look at it up close, and they will die from drying out and getting diseased that way. So these are all very effective methods of suppressing them before they get out of control. Is there anything we need to know about the difference uh, between the mites, spider mites, broad mites, and russet mites? Absolutely. There are a lot of differences. So spider mites and broad mites are true spider mites. They have eight pairs of legs. They're very closely related to spiders. Um, they look kind of similar to spiders. They look like your typical mite. Broad mites are a whole lot tinier. They are often found within the buds, so they can go unnoticed even a lot more often than spider mites can because they're that much harder to detect. Russets are completely different. Russet mites are not a true spider mite. They're actually an eriophyid mite. They, if you look at them closely, and they're very, very tiny, but if you look at them closely, they do not look like spider mites, like that little spidery figure. They look like carrots. They're <laughs> carrot shaped, <laughs> cigar shaped, kind of a wedge, yeah. and they've got two sets of legs coming out their front end. Yeah. So they're quite a bit different and the ways we deal with them are a little bit different too. So for true spider mites, you can definitely use these sprays. For things like the bud mites, they're not gonna be as effective, especially the neems and the soaps, the different sprays, because remember the, buds, the bud mites are often within the flower and not easy to access with materials like this. So for those situations, we really like to rely on beneficial insects. Now again, the name of the game with predatory mites and biological pest control is prevention and being proactive. If you're waiting to respond to a pest situation, it's going to be a lot more challenging and a lot more costly to get under control. One of our favorite mites to use for most situations is Californicus. So this is, I like to think of it as a generalist predatory mite because it will go after the spider mites, it will also go after the bud mites and the russets very oh, effectively. Excellent. So this one is very good for russets. The other fun thing about this mite is it's perfectly acceptable for preventive mode, is they can find small arthropods in the environment to feed on, mm -hmm. as well as pollen. So they can find alternate food sources, even if you don't have an existing infestation of mites. Okay. So if you were to release them again preventatively, yes. they're still gonna hang around that environment if something were to come around. Exactly, and they can build up their population in response to right. mites coming into your garden. Excellent. What's the genus on that? This is Neocelis californicus. Neocelis. okay. Fantastic mite. Another predator we like is, especially for spider mites, is this Amblesius or Neocelius phalasis. So this is another, and I brought this one especially because of the application method. As you can see, this is a little tray of bean leaves. So here we have bean leaf trifoliates with the spider mite and the predatory mite already on it. Looks very nasty. It is. It's, um, it's a great way, it's probably one of the better ways to release predatory mites because they travel to you with the plant material and the food source. Versus mites in a container mixed with corn grit or vermiculite and often not a food source. So this is a little bit more of a stressful environment to send insects versus this kind of an application method. Other mites that we really depend on now this here is Amblesius neocelius cucumeris. This is marketed for thrips control, but it's very effective at supplementing your program for russet mites. They love to go after russet mites, and these as well can find alternate food sources, so they're a great mite to populate the area with. One of the biggest things we can discuss and talk about and release for spider mite problems is Stratiolalap schemitis. This is the soil predatory mite. 
So what happens with this mite, one of our producers, he likes to say the level of mites that you have in August and September is pretty much what you can expect to start out with next spring. Mm. A lot of the spider mites go into a diapause stage, a reproductive hibernation, where they no longer reproduce, they kind of turn red-orange, so we call them red phase mites, and they leave your plants and go to the soil to overwinter. Mm. So anything we can do to attack them in that kind of quiescent stage when they're not doing too much damage to our plants by going after them with a soil predator will really help get on top of what level of mites you need to deal with in the spring. They go into a little hibernation waiting for the plants to come back and something to munch on. Mm -hmm. And so while they're in that state, we can uh, Absolutely. Can These mites do not hibernate, so they're just gonna go down there and tear after anybody they can find. Perfect. Yes. Carver, so I wanted to ask you, on this, do you just would you lay those little pl uh, leaves around on your plants? Exactly. Just put exactly. Them right on? Yeah. So uh, I think that's a great little segue, uh, Mel. Why don't we uh, Why don't we actually demonstrate? Let's actually do it. Go sure. make an application. Okay. All right. Great. Hey, we'll see you out in the garden. And now we're here. We're going to demonstrate how to deal with mites. Uh, mites are <laughs> mites are nasty, right? <laughs> Whether you're indoors, outdoors, uh, you know, mites can be a problem, you know? Uh, I think they're the worst, I really do. Yeah, uh, you know, indoors it's the spider mites, and I think outdoors these russet mites have right. really become an issue in the last couple yeah. of seasons. Yeah, and the russet mites, again, I think that they're being introduced primarily by clones. Uh, indoors with the spider mites, unfortunately, when you're not that experienced and you're not examining your plants closely and recognizing the little uh, stipples on your leaves uh, that signs of them sucking out the chlorophyll then you're going to end up seeing the webbing which you're going to see up at the top of the plant and actually i would advise you just getting rid of the plants bombing your area with a complete disinfectant and starting over again because i don't think there's anything that's going to cure your plant once they've they've reached that stage of building webs. Now, yeah. now, should we identify this uh, the infestation in an earlier stage? What can right. we do, Kyra? Absolutely. So monitoring, of course, as we talked about, uh, monitoring is going to be one of our key features right. in recognizing these problems before they start. Right. And further, to back it up, a couple steps before that, sanitation right. mm -hmm. and quarantine. Right. A lot of these right. things come in from friends, right. so be very mindful of that. Sure. Um, it shouldn't get to the level of it shouldn't. Of webbing. It shouldn't. But that's it, almost always. It's with people. It's their first or second mm -hmm. crop. They've never uh, seen it before. Uh, and again, uh, the cleanliness is huge. And also, mm -hmm. again, the diatomaceous earth and the tangle foot will help you a lot. Uh, but really, preventing them from ever getting to your plants is really where it's at. You don't want to start with that. Yeah. So again. Um, why don't you do a demonstration for us on some, right. of, some right. of the controls that we have here today, Carl? So if you do need to step up your level of assault and get to some kind of predatory mite that you're releasing, um, we've got options for that, and let's talk about how to release that. So for true spider mites, uh, you will notice the webbing. That's one thing that's very different between the spider mites and the areophyids. You're not going to see the webbing with the russet right. mites. Gotcha. That's a, a tetranicus mite, two spot, that kind of a thing. That's a spider mite situation. So for those, we have mites that are very good at going after true spider mites. This one here is our phalasis, Neocelius phalasis on bean leaves. So this is the nicest way to have the product, the predatory mites travel to you, is they travel on the plant material with a food source. So they get to you in the best quality. So all you're gonna do is pop this open and you're just gonna reach in here and pick up a little bean leaf trifoliate that if we grabbed our hand lens and we look at the underside, we are going to see quite a population of both spider mites and our predatory phalasis. So we're just gonna come right in here and lay that in on our plants and all of our predatory mites are going to climb onto the cannabis and start doing their thing. Simple enough. That was simple. Another excellent predator is this Californicus. I like to talk about this one as kind of a generalist mite because they go after both spider mites and mm. the areophyids ah. and pollen and small arthropods. So they can find a lot of things to eat in the garden. They're great for preventive because they can find so many other things mm -hmm. to eat. So when you're applying spider mites from a bottle application that's either gonna have corn grit or vermiculite, 
All you're going to do is you're simply going to gently roll the bottle around in your hands because we want to evenly distribute the mites within that carrier. Don't shake it, it's a little too hard on them. And then we are going to simply open this bottle. If you look in the underside of the lid, you can see them cruising around in there. That's oh, a yeah. lot of fun. Yeah. Like peeling that off in classrooms and showing that. So then we're just going to come in here and we're just going to do a little shake of the vermiculite and mites onto the plant. Then we're going to continue on to the next plants that we have to treat. Periodically, keep your lid with you. Periodically, you want to close this bottle up and gently roll it around some more right. to continue to redistribute the mites throughout the carrier so you're not shaking out all of the mites in mm -hmm. the first few plants and then just shaking right. out vermiculite. So is this the one uh, that they use if they're just going to live with some level of mites and just keep them under control? I would than eliminate. Absolutely. You know, right. This is one that we like to consider kind of a program mite, something mm -hmm. for preventive, something that you can just put out there and have it present to deal with any spider mites that blow in right. on these wind currents. They spin their webs and use mm -hmm. that to travel. These are great to have around. Okay. These are also excellent for our russet mites. Dealing with russets is a little bit more challenging. They're not a true spider mite. They're mm -hmm. an eriophyid, so we have to approach it a little bit differently. Um, some of our predators, like the phalaces, won't go after the eriophyids, the russets. So we do have to be mindful which mite we have. Just because you see stippling and you've identified it as a mite, it's important to kind of make that distinction if it's a true spider mite or an eriophyid, because right. the way you control those, they're going to branch off differently. So one of the mites we like for the russet, the eriophyid, is alongside with this Californicus, that's a fantastic predator, is the Cucumeris. So this one is generally marketed for thrips, but it's excellent to pepper in for eriophyid situations. And what's really nice about this mite especially is it comes in these slowly sachets. So this is a sachet. It's an envelope. Inside here, there is a self-breeding population. So we have our Cucumeris predatory mites mixed in a bran carrier with a food mite. And there's a teeny tiny hole in here. So all you're gonna do once you get a box of these is you're gonna take it out into your operation. Mm -hmm. And on a plant like this, you'd wanna hang it on a plant stake so it doesn't kind of weigh right. down the whole thing like a Charlie Brown Christmas tree. But on the bigger plants, you can just hang it within the foliage. And the mites will slowly release out of that hole for a period of about six weeks. Wow. So it's a nice, slow release, kind of set it and forget it system mm -hmm. so that they're there and you know they're out there. Um, is there anything about like time of day? Is there any do's or don'ts, you know, that we need to know with any of these applications? Not really. Time of day isn't really important for the mites. Mm -hmm. One thing that's going to be very advantageous for all of our mite problems is a thorough end of season cleanup. So what we do at the end of our crop is we introduce this soil predatory mite. So one thing we like to talk about is the fact that as the day lengths shorten, a lot of these mites will go into a hibernation phase, right. diapause, and right. they will head down to the soil to overwinter. Yeah. So one of our producers, the producer that creates this for us, the Stradiolae Laps, he likes to say the amount of spider mites that you have in August and September is what you can expect to start with next spring. <laughs> So doing a dose of soil predatory mites will really help overcome a lot of those overwintering stages. Mm -hmm. And all you're going to do, you're going to mix this around just the same way we did with the other bottled product. Carefully roll it end to end, side to side. You're going to take out this little paper stopper that allows airflow but doesn't allow our mites to leave as they're shipping. And you're going to open this up and just sprinkle a small pile of the soil mites onto the soil surface. They do not like to be incorporated into the soil. They will work themselves down in as mm -hmm. deep as they like to go. Do they get watered in? Are they just, just that little pile right there? <coughs> it's just fine. Just, just the little it. pile right there. They don't need to be watered in, but mm -hmm. watering will not interfere with them. Okay. They do not like flooded conditions mm -hmm. or freezing conditions. Right. Other than that, they are very adaptable. Right. Excellent.
This is a pretty comprehensive uh, mite controls uh, yeah. program that you have. Yes. All right. Thanks so much for demonstrating that to us sure. today, Kyra. This is one protected plant. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's got a lot of controls going on, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, thanks for joining us on uh, Mite Control right. and the Mite Control demonstration.